When Juan Garcia Esquivel was a small boy, he lived with his family in Tampico, Mexico, where the whirling mariachi bands let out joyful yells as they stamped and strummed. <laughs> By age six, Juan was curious about music. There was a piano at Juan's house, but it was a player piano. A paper roll told it which keys to play. Clever Juan had an idea. He disabled the paper roll and turned his parents' jangly piano into one he could practice on. He played it day and night. By age 10, Juan was captivated by music. He loved to play piano anytime, anywhere. Sometimes he'd disappear from house in search of an audience and his family would have to go looking for him. They always found him in front of a piano. When Juan's family moved to Mexico City, the country's bustling capital, Juan found work playing piano at Mexico's first 24-hour radio station. He performed for 15 minutes each day and was paid two pesos a show, enough to buy a sandwich and a taxi ride home. He was just 14 years old. Juan started learning all he could on his own. No music teachers, lessons, or schools. Without traditional training in how musical notes went together, Juan focused instead on how sounds could be arranged. Finally, Juan felt ready to create his own music. So when at the age of 17, he was offered the job of orchestra leader, by the radio station, Juan gladly took it. When the radio comedian needed music for a skit about, say, a stout man walking his tiny poodle down a busy city street, Juan had to imagine what that might sound like. Juan might ask the kettle drums to go like a lumbering giant. He might ask the clarinets and oboes to, and like a dainty dog. He might tell the trumpets and trombones to, like the blaring of car horns. Juan tested and mixed and arranged all sorts of sounds to match the imaginary situations. He was an artist using dips and depths of color to create visit vivid landscapes. But instead of paint, Juan used weird and wild sounds, strange and exciting sounds. Juan started experimenting with popular Mexican tunes he tinkered with tempos, slow songs down, then reviving them up. He fiddled with dynamics, swapping smooth, soft sounds and startling loud sounds. He twisted chords and combined instruments to sound thrilling, dreamy, and often funny because Juan liked music that made people laugh. But underneath the humor, it took great musical skill to play Juan's challenging, new music. Nobody had ever heard music like Juan's. Soon he was making records and winning awards. You could find his records that people could buy in stores. Juan's innovative music could be heard at, on radios and record players all across Mexico. An important record company in the United States had heard about Juan's unusual music. Would he come to make records in America? Yes, yes, yes. Juan packed two suits. He bought a big red convertible sports car with a white top. Then he drove all the way to New York City. There, Juan found a music shop the size of a department store with three entire floors of strange and exotic instruments. He saw boobams, bamboo tubes, 
that could play a tune. He saw a spooky sounding electrical instrument called a theremin. A bazimba, a kazoo sounding contraption played with mallets. <laughs> the ondoline was an organ with a swaying keyboard and even a giant gong. So many odd new sounds to play with, Juan was in heaven. The late 1950s and early 1960s was a great time to be recording music. Scientists had discovered a new process called stereophonics, or stereo for short. It separated sounds, so when you listened to a recording, music would seem to come from the left side, the right side, or both sides at once. For sound artists like Juan, stereo was yet another exciting color for his musical palette. To make a good stereo recording, instruments needed to be kept apart while they were recorded. That way, the brap of the horns wouldn't get mixed in with the witty wee of the flutes. Most conductors used curtain screens or special booths to separate the instruments. That wasn't enough for Juan. Once he put half of his orchestra in a recording studio and the other half in another recording studio on the other side of the building. So far away, it felt like they were an entire city block away. The musicians wore headphones so they could hear what the others were playing. And so that everyone could see him, Juan conducted on closed circuit TV television that only the musicians could see. Juan had one more trick up his sleeve. He brought in singers. But the singers didn't sing words. They sang sounds. They would sing sounds like zoo, 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 and do, and pow. On Juan's early versions of popular songs, he'd replace the lyrics everyone knew with the singer's fun, flashy sounds. People loved Juan's colorful music. It took them to other worlds, other planets. It sounded like a crazy rocket ride zigzagging through outer space. When Juan wasn't making his unique music, he enjoyed many other things. He liked beautiful art, fancy cars, and elegant clothes, but Juan loved music the most. Juan made many records that and played hundreds of concerts with his orchestra. In Las Vegas, Juan and his musicians performed at the Stardust Hotel for 14 years in a row. Fans from near and far, including famous singers, actors, and actresses, would come to hear his out-of-this-world sounds. Juan also made music for dozens of movies and television programs, even a TV show especially for children. Now, Juan wasn't called Juan anymore. He'd explored sonic frontiers, expanded musical possibilities, and embraced the way people think about, listen to, and enjoy music. Now, Juan was the space age sound artist, simply known as Esquivel, with an exclamation point at the end. <laughs> 